thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Deb Self, our Executive Director for Greater Fairlands Association, um, for some welcoming statements. Deb, take it away. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I really appreciate you joining us today um, for a rainy afternoon at the Lagoon. Um, my name is Deb Self. I'm the Executive Director of Greater Fairlands Association. I've been there a little more than a year, and uh, I know that many of you have long-standing associations with the Association and the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary, and uh, I appreciate you welcoming me, welcoming me into this community. Um, I, along with some of our science and restoration staff, I'm happy to welcome several of our board members, as well as many local residents and folks from further away too, who want to learn more about the Bellinas Lagoon along with us. Uh, it's a very special place in the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, and I'm excited to have um, a couple of scientists here to um, lay out what's so special about this lagoon and why it, it's not just important to conserve it, um, but it represents a really unique opportunity to, um, to preserve um, a very a special kind of ecosystem that's kind of rare along the California coast. Uh, many of you have heard of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary is part of NOAA, and uh, Greater Farallons Association is a nonprofit organization that was founded 25 years ago this year um, to support the federal government in conserving the sanctuary. Um, our work includes conservation science, education, and ecosystem restoration, um, all of which are joint programs with the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. Um, just a note about how we're structured, um, about a third of our budget um, comes from the sanctuary, and the other two thirds has to be raised from foundations and community partners. So anyway, we're here as a nonprofit today and excited to expand our community and our knowledge about Bolinas Lagoon. Thanks so much for coming. And there's a little bit about Deb for all of you. Um, I will pass it over to myself now and repeat what Deb just said. Thank you all so much for coming this afternoon. Um, we're very, very happy to have you here. We already have about 40 guests in the room with us. Um, and my name is Kate Vimrose. I am the Bellinas Lagoon Program Coordinator I have actually been in this position for 10 years now, and I'm so lucky that I've been able to create a relationship with Bolinas Lagoon and with the community members in West Marin, Stinson Beach, Sea Drift, and Bolinas. Um, I absolutely love being able to leave my concrete jungle of San Francisco and head out to the coast where I get to participate in really great restoration projects. Um, on the left, that photo is a picture of me working at our green crab removal project. And then the two photos to your right um, are taken on Kent Island with some of my most favorite volunteers. Uh, I even drag my dad out to do field work with me. So that photo of him second to the second to the left there is us out on the beach doing a survey. So shout out to my dad. I think he's in the audience today as well. Um, anyhow, enough about me. Uh, let's jump into the event for the day. So here's a, an agenda for us. You can get an idea of what we have in store. Uh, first and foremost, though, I do have a, a couple logistics I want to relay. First of all, this is the first in a series of events that Greater Farallons Association will be hosting. So thank you so much for our kickoff um, joining us today. Our next event is going to be focused more so on um, all, all the projects happening in the lagoon, and that will happen early 2021. So. Um, we will be sure to reach out to you with dates um, and, and um, include your invitations to all of you 
for that event. Um, another quick logistic for the day, we are recording this event. So if you want to listen to us over and over again, or you want to share the link to the event with your family members and friends who couldn't join us today, I will be posting that on YouTube. And as soon as that is available, um, we'll be sure to send that out to you. Uh, another logistic, you might have noticed that you are all on mute and your cameras are off. Uh, just the uh, GFA staff will be um, available to see today during the presentation, uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't want you to interact with us. So please use the questions box. That will be your best friend today. Um, use that box to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. We have Elaine and Olivia here to help on the, the tech side. Um, and also, please use the question box to type in any questions that you want answered. When you originally registered for the event, you were given the opportunity to provide a question that you wanted answered during this event. And we have compiled those questions. We will get to them during the question and answer period. But if we can, we'll also try to answer some of the questions you type into that questions box. So, so please feel free to use it. Um, another quick logistic for the day. Um, I will be sort of our, our host and I'll be switching screens. So um, we'll be enjoying a lot of different great presentations, one from Wendy Cordish and one from Kirsten Lindquist. They'll be talking about the geology of Bellinas Lagoon and the birds of Bellinas Lagoon. Um, but before that, we're gonna jump straight into some trivia. So we'll get sort of our juices flowing. Um, we've got a great little interactive activity. Um, so I think we should kind of get underway. So uh, before we switch over to Elaine, who will be Vanna for the day, um, I want everybody to know that no trivia is complete without a prize. So if you answer these trivia questions correctly, the first person to type in the correct answer will receive one of these wonderful Greater Farallons Association t-shirts. And don't worry, gentlemen, we have them in men's sizes as well. So um, why don't we switch on over to Elaine and she will pull up our wheel and we can get our first activity underway. So um, what we're going to do is use that question box, get your fingers ready to type. The first person who answers the question correctly will receive a t-shirt and we'll see how many questions we can get through. Um, so stick your eyes on the screen right there. And Elaine, why don't we spin that wheel? Hey, Kate, spinning the wheel. Great, <laughs> got a question. Right, and the first question today. What is the most abundant winter bird species recorded during beach watch surveys at Bellinas Lagoon? So we'll take a couple moments here. Olivia will be monitoring the question box. Um, in case you're not familiar with beach watch, Kirsten will talk all about that during her presentation. So we will wait to see what answers come in. The most abundant winter bird. All right. And it looks like we have a winner. And that would be Yay! Jeff. Congrats, Jeff. Congratulations, Jeff. Fantastic. All right. Well, Olivia will be getting in touch with you. We want to make sure we have all the right information. We can send that t shirt on over to you. Um, and Elaine, let's spin that wheel again. All right. We are spinning the wheel. Right. Next up. Olivia, That's do you mind repeating the um, answer to that first question so everybody knows? Yeah, it was, so the question, what is the, what is the most abundant winter bird species recording during beach watch surveys? And the answer was bufflehead. Bufflehead. All right, the next question is, how old is Bellinas Lagoon? I know. <laughs> I know this one. knows. She'll be talking all about it during her presentation. 
kind of hard to guess, I think, this one. It might, I think it might be younger than you might think, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we can get within 1,000 years, we will consider the oh, answer correct. Yeah. So whoever, whoever answers within 1,000 years, I think, Olivia. We have some pretty big numbers here. <laughs> Kate's Kate's hint was really a clue into what type of number. It it's it's a lot younger than we think it is. You said within one thousand. Yeah, within one thousand years. All right, we have a winner, and that would be Scott Bimrose. <laughs> oh my gosh! No way! I did not tell my dad any answers to these questions. I swear. That His feels rigged. His answer was 7,000. Okay, yeah. the correct answer is 7,700. That is how old Bellinus Lagoon is. Nicely done, Kate's dad. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that feels like it's unfair. I swear, I swear. I didn't tell he him just anything. listens to when you talk about work. <laughs> yes, that's true. He does pay attention. That's good to know. Very good to know. Okay, so the answer to that one, how old is Bellinus Lagoon? 7,700 years old. Let's spin that wheel again, Elaine. What do you say? All right, we're spinning again. Okay. Got our question. All right. And then this next question is How many harbor seal pups were born in Bellinus Lagoon in 2019? I feel like we might need to give a hint, but let's wait. A minute here and see what people type in. Don't have the correct answer quite yet. Okay. Oh, yes, you do. Closer, okay. getting closer. Let's see. Is within 10 okay, Kate? I think within 10 is a okay. Yeah. All right. And Cynthia said 220. So Cynthia wins. Cynthia wow. wins. Well done, Cynthia. So the exact answer is actually 227. And we get that great data thanks to the Point Reyes National Seashore who does uh, harbor seal counts in the lagoon each year. Um, the 15 year average is 158 harbor seal pups. So 2019 was a good year. So 227, that was our final answer. All right, thank you very much, Elaine slash Vanna. I think that that's all we have time for today, but congratulations to our three trivia winners. Um, I hope everybody learned a little bit of something there. Um, and now let's head back to our PowerPoint and get started with some of these presentations. All right. Thank you again very much for the wheel. We will move next over to Dr. Wendy Cordish. Wendy is our geological oceanographer at Greater Farallons Association. So take it away, Wendy. Great, thanks Kate. And thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. I love talking about geology and um, love sharing why I find it interesting with people. Um, and Geological oceanographer is admittedly a mouthful, uh, but that just means I like sediment and seawater. And I like understanding how those change over time and how they form the earth and the ocean as we know it today. Um, I'm also from the Bay Area, so I really couldn't be happier to be preserving and protecting the beaches that I really grew up playing on, um, like Stinson and, and the lagoon. I remember going out there as a kid, um, and I still, uh, I still enjoy swimming out in the in the bay and the outer coast waters today. So I certainly appreciate living in such a, a beautiful um, and, and healthy coast. Um, but why don't we uh, go to the next slide and get started. So today, you know, you're know, you probably familiar with some of the more recent history of Bellinus Lagoon, but I bet you don't know it all the way back from 250 million years ago, unless, um, unless you're a geologist or maybe Kate's dad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, today I want to talk about uh, how the lagoon came to be and why it's really a renowned biological treasure, um, because it, it is one and it has an interesting history that's pretty unique. 
So for if you get your geologist hat on and get in the mindset of thinking on millions of years, um, you know, think about the fact that we live on the edge of a continent, right? It's been in constant motion here for the past 250 million years. If you find the West Coast and, and uh, North America there, you realize that um, since the continents were all connected in the supercontinent called Pangea, uh, we've been on the West Coast, right, for 250 million years. As you watch it change over time, we've been on the coast, right? And that fact that we live on the edge of a continental plate um, has really shaped our state from all the way from, you know, the tip of Point Reyes to the very top of the Sierras. It's all because of this movement over time, right? And we, we on the coast uh, live with the fault, of course, right? That's the main way that we kind of experience um, living on the edge of the tectonic plates. And, and um, sometimes we get reminders of this in the middle of the night when you wake up um, with an earthquake, but we really crisscross the fault all the time. So here you can see where the fault runs. It, it um, slices right through Bodega Bay, and right down through Point Reyes, through San Francisco, down along 280 actually, and then the Santa Cruz Mountains, and then all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so it's pretty unique that we live um, on the coast and on this edge of these two tectonic plates. So you can see the arrows there show North America, that's a 25 mile thick continent, really thick. On the other side, you have the Pacific plate, it's only five miles thick and it's an oceanic plate. And those two are grinding past each other and they've been doing that for millions of years. Um, but you might have noticed something interesting about Point Reyes, and that's that it's on the wrong side. If you look, it's on the ocean side of the plate, right? Not the continent, but it's land. That's kind of confusing. Um, but the reason it's there is because the Pacific plate actually ripped off a chunk of the continent. So the, you know, when these plates grind past each other, it's not a smooth motion. It's, it's rough and it rips chunks, but it ripped the entire triangle of Point Reyes and dragged it 200 miles north along the coast. So I like to say Point Reyes is really from Southern California. It's just visiting and it's still um, passing its way, you know, it, millions of years in the future. It's still continuing its way north. Um, but another fun fact about that that I like and I think of probably too frequently is that it moves at the speed that your fingernails grow. So it's about five centimeters a year, and it's not that fast, but it's not that slow either. Um, and I really honestly think about this when I cut my nails. So maybe <laughs> you will too, maybe Kate will. I will, <laughs> I, really I will. Think about it. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is really fascinating. And, and in the inset here, you can see another um, example of the fault showing up in our, our daily lives is the color change you can see across Tamales Bay there. So you have dark green on one side, light green on the other, forest on one side, grass on the other. And that's because the underlying rocks are different. So that chunk of point rays coming that ripped you know, off and got dragged north is really made of granite. So that's a totally different kind of rock. On the other side is marine sediment. The rocks, the underlying rocks, make a different kind of soil. And the soil supports a different kind of plant community. So this is a really neat example of where you can see that geology impacts the biology. Um, and that's something I'll point out uh, another couple of times today, but this is a really special thing. And if you're driving that area, you should try and take a peek, but people and geologists come from all over the world to see this. And it's actually um, where they, this, this uh, phenomenon helped um, prove the theory of plate tectonics in the seventies is such a clear example. But if we move down a little bit and look at Bolina Sagoon, as uh, Mr. Bimrose knows, it was formed almost 8,000 years ago. Sorry, Kate. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I love it when people know geology. That's that's the point of this. Um, but right, so the fault formed the lagoon, um, and it created this shallow bay where sand and mud could accumulate, and that's what made the setting for the rich wetland habitat that's there today. So the fault, you know, is is really. Um, uh, the reason that the lagoon is there. So, you know, thanks San Andreas for the beautiful Bolinas Lagoon. Um, but that's, you know, 250 million years of geology summed up in a couple of minutes. Um, but that's how the lagoon formed and why there's these shallow bays here. Um, but what's shaping it now? Now we get to move on to human time scales. Um, and when you think in human times, 
time scales and the coast, you think about sediment, right? And if you look at the top picture on the left, when I say sediment, sand is a kind of sediment. When you think sand, you know, you probably think Dinson Beach on a warm summer day, sand between your toes. And that, you know, that is as coastal Californians, that's our experience with sand. We also encounter it many, many other times in our lives um, because sand is actually the second most consumed natural resource on the planet after water. And that's a pretty astounding fact. If you think about how much time we spend thinking about how to conserve water, Contrast that to how much time we spend thinking about how to conserve sand. Right? We, most people probably, if you're not a geologist, you haven't really thought about that. Um, but no. sand, if you look at that image on the bottom, um, you know, sand is a major component of concrete. So every, you know, if you look at San Francisco, every single road, every single building, every house is made predominantly of sand. And those are sand dunes under there too. Um, every computer in every one of those homes relies on silica, which is made of sand, beach sand, right? So this is a resource we really have to think about how we use. And it's even more important to those of us who live on the coast, right? Because we literally rely on it to live. We, we our, our homes are on the coast. Um, so we really need all hands on deck or all sands on deck um, thinking about <laughs> this and thinking how to, how to really preserve our sand. I'm like going to go to the dude. next slide. <laughs> so what's going on in Bolinas Lagoon? Right? Bolinas Lagoon is a really dynamic place. You see that from day to day, but inside the lagoon, there's two ways that sediment um, accumulates. The first is from the ocean, right? You have beach sand that gets um, swashed into the lagoon with a high tide and it falls out of the water. And that's what forms Kent Island, right? Kent Island is pretty sandy. If you've ever gone out there with Kate, it's a really sandy area. Um, and some of the sand goes out with the ebb tide. But the other type of material on the shoreline of the lagoon is that ooey gooey stuff your shoes get stuck in when you walk along the coast, right? The mud. I've been stuck clay. many times, many times. <laughs> yeah, Kate, had to, <laughs> Kate had to rescue me out of that mud a couple of times, actually. <laughs> Um, but you know, I mean, anyone who's walked along the shorelines knows that stuff. But that is about 20% um, of the sediment. You know, is is that it's mud and clay, and it gets washed down from all those creeks and tributaries that um, make their way into the lagoon. So you have mostly sand from the ocean, but also mud and clay. Um, and that mud and clay, where you have that accumulating, that's where you get that perfect wetland habitat. That ooey gooey stuff is perfect for wetland plants and animals. Um, so. These processes have been going on for 7,000 years, almost 8,000 almost 8, years. Um, there's been an overall balance in these processes. Um, but you might be thinking, you know, I see changes in the lagoon all the time, right? When you walk out there, I was, I was shocked the first time I went in a different season and saw how, how different the lagoon can look um, just, just seasonally. But that, that's natural. Beaches accumulate in the summer and they erode in the winter. And they also change on a uh, more decadal scale with El Nino or La Nina. La Nina's build sand, El Nino's erode them. So changing out there, you know, the lagoon, especially of all coastal um, environments, is extremely dynamic. So it does change all the time. Um, but when we think about right, what's going on in the future, we think about sea level rise. So for the past 15 years, um, really, it's advances in climate science that tell us what's going on locally give us a better idea of how the lagoon is going to be impacted. And this is this is really in particularly helped our understanding of Bolinas Lagoon. Right? We used to think that it was going to be filled with sediment. And now we know from uh, the newest science that, uh, you know, our, our ocean backyard is slowly moving towards us as sea level rise. And that's, you know, that's going to be a big challenge for everyone that lives in California. Um, and you know, our habitats, our shoreline, it, it will be increasingly inundated and, and we have to think about that. Um, but one of the coolest things about Bolinas Lagoon and sediment in Bolinas Lagoon and, and the special habitats of the lagoon are that they can naturally adapt to sea level rise, right? Wetland plants can trap sediment like mud and uh, help it accumulate on the shoreline. 
So it reduces erosion and then plants grow on top of it and it can naturally grow and adapt with sea level rise provided there's enough shoreline to do that. That's pretty cool and there's no other habitat that can do this. So wetlands, salt marshes are the most important and the most unique habitat along our coast. Molina Lagoon is one of the, the best places with a rich habitat like this. Um, and you know we can all we can all um, help think about how to help these habitats grow and um, adapt along the shoreline. But to learn more about that, you'll have to tune in to our next uh, meeting because now I have to transition to the promise I made at the beginning, which was I have a secret to tell you about how you can see into the future. Um, so today, maybe some of you went on a rainy walk along the coast and saw that the tides were really high. Um, well, they were, it was about 9 a.m. today, I think, but there's, there, these are king tides and king tides are just the name for the highest tides of the year. Um, but those are today, tomorrow and Tuesday. And um, you can go out and see them. And actually we would love if you go out and see them. It's a way to sneak a peek into what our coastlines would look like um, every day with future sea level rise, right? The, on average, these are about a foot or two higher than your average tides. So we get this rare opportunity to see and feel what our coast would look like in the future. Um, and it's a neat opportunity to get out there and see what uh, your part of the coast looks like too. So uh, check out the coast, take photos, and Kate, would, Kate and I would love to see them. Um, she'll share her email with you and uh, we'd love to see it. It's a, it's a great opportunity. I'll be going out there to check out my part of the coast and see what it looks like. Um, and we hope to see yours. So thanks for joining today. And I hope you learned something new about a place that you already love. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. I think that's a good point, actually. When, I, when I'm out at the lagoon from day to day, it does look different. Some days it looks like it's filling in more than others. And, um, but I think that that was a good point. You really have to look at it on a longer term time scale and know that there is a balance happening, even if it doesn't look like it on a day to day basis. Um, yeah. And yes, yeah. definitely. I think today with the high tides this morning and we had rain, thank goodness, um, we really got to look into the future this morning. Uh, get a sense of of what the decades ahead might look like. So thank you very much for the presentation. That was fantastic. Um, let's move from geology over to birds. I will pass it over to Kirsten Linquist, our conservation science program manager. Kirsten, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm Kirsten Linquist. I like birds. I love Bolinas. I um, first moved to Bolinas in 2000 um, as an intern for Point Blue um, out at the Palomar and Field Station. So I've been studying birds for um, about 20 years and a lot, spent a lot of time in the waters. You can see in this picture offshore, I spend about a month of my year at sea working with the sanctuary and Point Blue conservation science. Um, uh, as a bird observer on research trips. So I've spent a ton of time in the Bolinas Lagoon area on the beaches and at sea, and this is my favorite place, absolutely. So long-term, long-time um, West Marin resident, I'd say on and off again. Um, next slide. So I don't know how many of you know um, about the Beach Watch program, but Beach Watch is um, a program, a citizen science or community science program that is a partnership between the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary and the Greater Fairlands Association. And Beach Watch has not one, but three survey sites in the Bolinas Stinson area. So out on the ocean side of Sea Drift, on the lagoon side of Sea Drift, and then out along the kind of entire expanse of um, Bolinas Lagoon, uh, sorry, Bolinas Beach up around the corner um, up onto Agate Beach. So we have three different survey sites and we have two sets of teams that survey at each of those sites within the month. 
So in this picture, we have um, two of our current Beach Watch um, volunteers, Joan Lampier and Carolyn Longstreth, both West Marin residents um, that have been fabulous birders and have been studying this area for a long time. So we've been around for 27 years collect, uh, collecting this data. And we're looking at live wildlife and dead wildlife, uh, oil deposition. I'm sure um, if you've been on the beach as West Marin residents do, you will have seen oil at some point in time. Um, there's just a lot of a lot of seasonality and change in this location over time. And it is one of our richest sites in terms of the lagoon, in terms of our bird activity is just phenomenal. So one of the reasons that Beach Watch was first created um, was to be able to protect our coastal environments in the case of an oil spill. Because when oil spills, and as West Marin residents, we know that it has, it has come ashore several times within our lifetimes, that when that oil comes ashore, we need to be able to say, hey, we know how clean these beaches were. We know what wildlife was here today. We know what it was here yesterday. We actually know the average over the last 27 years in this month and be able to go to court have the data go to court and be a voice for our beaches, for our wildlife, for our lagoons. So Beach Watch has been involved in five major oil spills and the data has been used in um, as evidence in all of those cases and helped award huge restoration funds. A lot of people have participated in that effort, but Beach Watch has been a part of that and our people um, collecting data on these West Marin beaches. Next slide. So on Bolinas Lagoon, we have one survey site um, along the backside, the north side there um, of Sea Drift. We have seen over 100 species of live birds on those surveys over 27 years. It is our richest site across, we have 65 sites at this point in time, from Mendocino down to um, the southern part of San Mateo. And this site is just above and beyond in terms of richness, changes, seasonality. Um, here we have just a handful of our most abundant species. They are, um, Bolinas Lagoon is definitely a kind of a gold star <laughs> survey site. Next slide. So we have a lot of different stories that we can tell. Um, when you have a long-term data set like we do of 27 years, there you, you start to be able to talk about long-term changes. If you looked at um, if you looked at did a study on Bolinas Lagoon just in the last couple of years, you would have no idea that in fact Wim Willets have decreased significantly over the last 27 years. What is going on with Willets? Well, our data set can't speak to that. We know that birds are, are declining in these West Marin in Bolinas Lagoon, but we need to partner with other, with other researchers, other agencies to be able to pull all the pieces together. But having a long-term data set in a place like Bolinas Lagoon is just priceless in terms of protecting from climate change from other human caused changes like oil spills, development, all of these kinds of things are really important. And long-term data is uh, hard to maintain, but with the partnership of the sanctuary and the association and all of the amazing 160 people that we have on beaches um, collecting data throughout our range, it is a phenomenal force um, and voice that is sought after when we're trying to um, protect these wild places. Next slide. So what can you see on the lagoon today? Well, the lagoon changes a lot throughout the year. So we have Bay Area breeders or residents, so birds that are here 
year round. And maybe they breed exactly in the lagoon, maybe they breed just adjacent, just in the, the close area. So we have a number of species. So for uh, gulls, we have Western and California. You know, the list of Bay Area breeders is, it's, an, it's a nice solid list, but the, the number, the masses of birds that we, um, that we see say in this picture or that we think of when we think of the lagoon are often the winter migrants um, and also the summer migrants. So we have birds that breed in the Arctic and Northern um, Americas that, that breed in the summer in these Northern latitudes and then they come South and they come to Bolinas Lagoon as, as a, one of the main um, wintering sites. And then we also have other species, so summer migrants that are actually arriving here in the spring, they stay here for the summer and then they leave again around now, a little bit earlier than now. So those are birds like brown pelicans, elegant terns, herman's gulls, also offshore the sooty shear water. These birds are leaving to go breed in, in the winter while well, sooty shear waters are actually going all the way to New Zealand. They are uh, near shore, coastal. They're not so much in the lagoon, but they are a phenomenal one to know about. So at the lagoon, we have this confluence of all of these, these layers of birds and activity. We've got the birds coming in from the north now and just flooding us with ducks and all kinds of amazing things. We have our residents, we have the snowy egrets and the great egrets and the great blues and the cormorants that are here year round. And then we have these others, you know, that are headed off to Mexico again. It's just, it's like, it's like a big puzzle. All these pieces coming together and they come together because there's food, because the sanctuary is one of the richest places in the world, in the ocean. Um, and the confluence of that richness with the lagoon um, being a shelter, a resting place, a foraging place, it's just a, it's a phenomenal, um, it's a phenomenal treasure that you have in your backyard. And we are here to help have your back, to help protect that. So birds are important. I just barely touched on a few, a few little pieces about what we do um, and why Bolinas Lagoon is so special. Um, but birds are important. They're indicators of the health of an ecosystem. They're indicators of changes of threats to an ecosystem. And long-term research projects are just essential to protecting these wild creatures, these wild places, and to document any, any changes that are occurring. So that is, that is all I have. Great, thank you, Kirsten. Did you say yeah. over 100 species of birds have been- 100 species, over 100 wow. species of live birds have been seen on beach watch surveys. Wow, yeah. that's yeah. unbelievable. Well, I mean, if I were a migrant bird, I'd be traveling thousands of miles to get to Bolinas too. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, people are flocking to Bolinas more and more um, to West Marin in general. So I know anyone who is at the event tonight and lives in West Marin can probably relate to that as well. So it's a special place and the animals Kate, and the people know it. I'll just put in a little plug. So, um, Hopefully in the next 12 months, we will be hosting another um, Beach Watch training. So if you're interested, you don't need to know all of the bird species. We put a lot of education, do a lot of teaching um, of the local species of birds. But um, if you are interested, please check us out because we will be recruiting for new people in the area. That's great. That is a good plug, definitely. Um, well, thank you, Wendy and Kirsten, so much for your wonderful presentations. Um, as Wendy said in her presentation, if you do take any photos of the King Tides, please send them over to me. Um, we would love your permission to use them on our website or to share them with our partners. 
Um, you can also email me directly if you want additional information about the Beach Watch program, um, like Kirsten said. And um, I have to say, I got, a, I got a text message from my parents while you guys were presenting, and they told me that they actually had no idea that they had had the answer correct. So they felt bad that they had responded, um, but I guess that means maybe they don't pay as much attention to me as I'd like. So anyway, I learned a bunch during those presentations, um, especially the fingernail thing. Uh, I also love to hear over 100 um, species of birds in Bolinas Lagoon. That's huge. That's great. Um, so thank you, both of you, so much for your presentations. Uh, we are going to head into our next segment of the day, which is all about the questions that everybody shared with us. Um, so I am going to head straight over there right now. Hopefully my computer will act accordingly. Okay, so when you all registered, you were able to send in a question that you wanted answered. And we have compiled those questions into these three main, <clears throat> excuse me, three main categories. Um, some of your questions were more um, project specific. So we are gonna wait until our next event uh, in early 2021 to answer those questions. Apologies to my Kent Island volunteers. I can't dive into the Kent Island information today, but we will be talking about it in late January, early February. So stay tuned. Um, so anyhow, the, the questions that you all had sent in, we've compiled into these three categories. And I, I don't think that a visual of the Wheel of Fortune would be complete unless we also had a Jeopardy visual. So this is a little nod to our friend, Alex Trebek. Uh, a couple caveats here. We will not be posing these questions in the form of a phrase. <laughs> and we will not be answering them in the form of a question. Um, but we do want this to be interactive. So use your questions box again and type in the category and the value of the block that you want us to read. And that's kind of how we'll go through all of these questions. Um, there is one daily double question embedded in here. So whoever selects that daily double will receive their very own GFA tote bag. So um, I'm going to pass over the controls to Olivia. Olivia is standing by reading that questions box. So Olivia, do we have our first selection? Yes, we do. Um, Cynthia says geology for 400. Geology for 400. How do I know that all of the big money questions are probably going to get selected first? All right, let's see. Wendy, you're up for this one. I will read it off. Why are oceans salty and rivers and streams are not? Oh, well, first off, thanks, Cynthia, for choosing geology. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, ocean, yeah, oceans are salty, rivers and streams are not. Um, the answer is geology, my favorite kind of answer. <laughs> if you think of rivers and streams, water that ends up in rivers and streams is either melted snow or it comes from rain. And both of those are freshwater sources. Um, and the ocean is kind of the end, right? If you remember the water cycle from when you were a kid, uh, those diagrams, but the ocean is the end of the line. Um, and it accumulates all of the um, everything that runs into it. But rainwater is acidic and it erodes rocks and it erodes salts out of rocks and those eventually make their way to the ocean and those stay in the ocean. Some of them stay there for very, very, very long periods of time. So the salt builds up in the ocean and fresh water evaporates out of it. That's the salt. So fresh water cycles, salt stays in the ocean and that's why there's a difference. So the salt comes from the rocks. So it comes back to geology. Always goes <laughs> back to geology. Geology rocks. Geology rocks. Okay, Olivia, let us know what our next selection is. Yeah, um, Kay and Scott both want conservation for 300. Ooh, conservation for 300. Okay, how can we learn more specific information? about the projects happening around the lagoon. That is a perfect shameless plug for our next event, basically. 
Um, I want you all to sign up to our newsletter. I will um, put a link up to that um, later on in the presentation. And um, we will definitely send out a notice to everybody so that you can join the next event. But basically what we plan to do is have our partners with us. So we'll have um, National Park Service, we'll have Marin County, we'll have um, Audubon Canyon Ranch, um, and then obviously Greater Farallons Association and Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary so that we can all give updates on the various projects that are happening around the lagoon, including the Green Crab Project, Ken Island Project, um, the North End Project or the project up at the Y, the South End Project, which GFA is leading, and um, multiple efforts through Marin County um, to plan for sea level rise at Stinson Beach, as well as um, National Park Service's work that they are doing on the parking lots in Stinson Beach um, and providing some protections to East Coot Creek, because as we know, back in 2018, I think it was, um, that creek jumped its banks, to put it mildly, and kind of wiped out the parking lots in Stinson. So they're doing a lot of work to repair those and to um, help prepare East Coot for any future changes. Um, all the projects around the lagoon work together to help the lagoon prepare for future changes. So we will um, talk more about that at the next event. Thank you for that question. All right, Olivia, what is our next selection? We don't have any quite yet. Oh so. my goodness. <laughs> want to get there um i might question. want to pick one i think i'm gonna pick one for it kate birds i loved all the talk about birds no offense wendy <laughs> i love rocks too i don't we'll take our turn i don't want to i like birds I wanna, too i like birds so let's do birds for 300 how about that Where there's no shame in liking birds wendy <laughs> <laughs> Where do pelicans go at night, Kirsten? Can you can you give us some insight on that? Um, yeah, so I, I, let's speak specifically about um, brown pelicans. Um, okay. Pelicans like to roost on protected sites like small islands, uh, rocky bluffs, sandbars in lagoons. So in Bolinas Lagoon, good examples would be like um, sandbars, Kent Island, the edges of Kent Island possibly. Those would be the kind of sites that they would prefer, somewhere where they're not going to be disturbed. Um, but in general, most things are, are a little bit more related to tide cycles. Um, but yes, they do roost at night. Okay. So they're not sleeping just on the surface of the ocean or on the surface of the lagoon. They can, but they um, sea lions will grab them. Sharks can grab them. So they they have predators, even though they're quite so large. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good to know, Olivia. Do we have anyone else chiming in who wants to um, yeah. ask a question? Um, Al would like geology for two hundred. <laughs> Geology for 200. All right, Wendy, can you tell us how is sand formed? Man, well, thanks, Al. Um, I think Al might be my dad as well. Oh my gosh, so much love from our family today. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's a family affair here. It, always is. it is, it is. Man, it's nice. Um, well, sand forming is maybe one of my other favorite things to talk about. Um, sand is uh, I mean, form, so it forms from broken down bits of bigger rocks. Uh, and most beaches in California have the same kind of sand. Um, it's that, you know, the gray kind of sand. When you pick it up and look at it, it has little black flecks in it. Um, and that's from Sierra Nevada granite. It's just straight broken down. It's, it's telltale. If you see that kind of sand in um, out of context, geologists in California would know that's, that's Sierra Nevada granite, granite sand because all the rocks, I mean, the whole Sierras are made of um, Sierra Nevada granite. It erodes, travels downstream, breaks up into tiny you know, pebbles and breaks down further and breaks down further. And by the time you get to the coast, it's sand-sized grain. Um, but uh, you can get local pocket beaches that have different um, rocks in the cliffs. 
And that's where you can get a black sand beach or in Big Sur, there's a purple sand beach from granite. Um, I just saw that one this winter, it's very cool. Um, but sand tells you a lot about the beach and where the materials came from. Um, and I even have a sand collection because um, you can tell so much about the environment and the origin and the history of a beach just from the sand that's on it. So there's a lot there. <laughs> Great, thank you, Wendy, for that one. Um, Olivia, do we have anyone else typing in some requests? Um, yes, we do. Uh, did we do birds for 200? Uh, no, we didn't. I think I chose 300 my first go around. So we'll do birds for 200. All right. I think you touched on this a little bit, Kirsten, but um, what winter birds can we expect to see nowadays? So if someone goes out tomorrow, um, checks out that big king tide, what kind of birds um, might they also see? Well, winter birds, you're going to see a lot of species of shorebirds from very small to very large, um, a lot of water birds, so ducks, mostly uh, those are the big, the big families that are kind of that are coming in in the winter months. So the um, the scop, the golden eye, um, the widgeon, American and Eurasian, the buffleheads, um, a lot of different species of water and shorebirds. One interesting thing to note is during a king tide, the typical spots where the birds roost, uh, the shorebirds roost at high tide, they are gonna get swamped out. And so they get pushed to all kinds of weird places um, on king tides. And that is maybe foretelling a little bit <laughs> about humans as well. Yeah, interesting. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. That bufflehead, that bufflehead is that most abundant winter bird. Um, okay, Olivia, do we have another question or two? I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two more. Yeah, we have birds for 400. Birds for 400. Kirsten, you're very popular. Okay, what do birds at Bellinas Lagoon like to eat? Well, since we have a lot of species of birds and a lot of strategies for eating, they're eating a lot of different things. So there are like the cormorants and other pursuit diving ducks are chasing small schooling fish um, within the lagoon or in the Bolinas that, you know, the outer areas, the Duxbury areas. Um, you have the shorebirds with all different shapes and lengths of bills, and they are focusing on things in the mud, um, kind of specializing in different areas, you know, different worms and that kind of um, thing in the, the sandy bits. We have shorebirds that are eating um, mussels and things like that. Oyster catchers, they're eating the more rocky substrate um, things along piers and Duxbury. Um, so, and then we have aerial divers that like turns, pelicans, things that are spotting from above and diving down. So they're also kind of a schooling fish. So we have a little, little bit of everything. A um, little bit of everything. <laughs> Bolinas Lagoon provides it all. Okay, let's do one last final question. Okay, we have conservation for 400. Conservation for 400. Ding, ding, ding. That is the daily double. Ooh, who is it that won the daily double, Olivia? Scott Bimrose. <laughs> oh my gosh, are you serious? <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. This is making me look bad. I, I think that we should pick another person in the audience to receive a free tote. We'll have to figure that out later. Um, not that I don't like the question selection. Thank you, Dad. Um, <laughs> we can give it really to Liz, Liz Hendrickson because she also submitted. Requested. Perfect. That sounds perfect. Thank you, Dad. I know you. I know you'll share. Um, okay, how will climate change impact Bolinas Lagoon over time? Um, I think Wendy kind of touched on this a little bit. She definitely talked about the rising sea levels, 
um, and the fact that a lot of habitats are going to change and shift because of that. Um, you know, we've got these these high tides happening. When you combine that, though, with increased storm events, which are also a likely impact of climate change, you're going to really have those um, rising water levels. So you'll have increased flooding, you'll have increased erosion, and um, you know, just increased stress on not only the environment and um, the ecological communities, but also the built communities. So our roads um, are going to be under stress, our homes, our built infrastructure. So, you know, that that habitat along the edge of Bolinas Lagoon, where we've got that, that marshland and that more upland habitat, is really, I think, going to become more and more critical. Because as these water levels rise, we're going to need habitat like that um, sort of keep pace with the rising water levels um, and allow all those birds that Kirsten's talking about um, to sustain themselves. Um, we need that habitat for food and shelter and breeding and, um, you know, as humans we need it too. We want it to protect the built environment um, and we also want to be able to recreate. We want to do all of the awesome bird watching that comes with learning about the different bird species. So, um, although climate change may be impacting the lagoon, um, I do think that we have a lot of skills and tools that we need to help the lagoon to adapt to these changes. So um, I realize we are getting to the end of our time today. It's already five o'clock. So I want to just quickly switch back over to our presentation. And thank you all so much for joining us for an afternoon at the Lagoon. Before I bring it back to Deb for some closing remarks, um, there's my email address again. Please feel free to send me questions, send me your King Tide photos, um, send me information that you want um, about the Beach Watch program or anything having to do with the work that Greater Farallons Association does. If you are interested in signing up for our newsletter, follow the link right there at the bottom of the screen. Um, and again, at the end of this um, event, I will be reaching out to everybody with follow-up information and a link to the YouTube video, um, as well as a bunch of other great stuff, including information about our next um, virtual event in early 2021. So thank you all again so much for joining and I'll pass it over to Deb for some final words. Hi everybody, thanks so much for being with us today. I loved that and I hope you did too. And uh, again, it's just the first of, I think we're gonna have three um, events in this series. Hopefully it wasn't too sciencey for you, but um, I just, I already, I talked to somebody who's attending who said she didn't know that sand was the second most consumed natural resource. And even though I have a degree in geology, I did not know that either. So anyway, um, fantastic. Uh, thanks again for being part of the community and interested in our coast. And uh, I know that Kate will be following up with you. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again next time. Please stay safe, stay sane, have a great holiday season and new year, and we will see you early in 2021. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.